Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Vibes Nation. I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Zone. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Addict New Release Roundup. Uh, if you're new here, hey, welcome. Uh, what we do is we go back and forth and we talk about the latest home video releases. And uh, oh boy, uh, we have some really cool, very diverse and um, some very like hot topic -y sort of uh, titles to talk about. Uh, so it's a little teaser uh, to get you all hyped, but I'm really excited. Uh, and I'm going to start off this party with one that maybe isn't as high profile as some of the ones we're going to cover, but I was really hyped for personally. Um, and that is The Lion and Winter uh from kino studio classics and here is the back um no no reversible cover art i think they only have one this week that has reversible cover art um but uh we we talk about this a lot but if you want the nice slip cover you probably want to order it um sooner rather than later but um this is a reissue um i know um kino had put this out previously um and i had kind of like for whatever reason sort of like drug my feet on it um but now it's back and i'm excited about that because now i can finally own it and it's awesome um so uh dylan i know you and i both love um alternative christmas movies and this mm -hmm. certainly fits that bill you've seen this right you were you, i thought i you have not i actually I actually own the old Kino Blu-ray, but I never got around to it. And now we have this. <laughs> I guess this is um, my default. Do you, um, before I get into it, do you know if there was anything new on this disc? I thought they were all maybe poured over. Um, uh, that's what I was looking up right now because okay. I figured I hadn't I hadn't watched this title yet. So I hadn't gotten into it, but I'll, I'll, I'll circle back around to that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's getting a little bit ahead of myself anyways. But yeah, the movie is... Um, think about the most dysfunctional Christmas gathering, how it's like uncomfortable and maybe like the, the parents don't get along and then like magnitude that by like a thousand, right? Um, you have the king who has essentially exiled his wife to um, her own castle. Like she's literally a prisoner. Um, basically, they trot her out once a year uh, at Christmas time. But this year is a little bit different because um, they are figuring out who is going to, um, which one of the brothers is going to like inherit the throne. And so, yeah, it is very Game of Thrones in like scheming and manipulating and like who's actually going to, you know, be on the throne, um, which I won't spoil it, but um, there is a lot of delicious backstabbing, deal making. Um, it's it's so crazy um some of the like shenanigans like there's um a girlfriend of one of the sons and the dad is like having an affair with her uh <laughs> so this is like this is something kind of brought up pretty early on and they sort of use her um as a kind of pawn later on in the movie which i think is an interesting kind of way to do that but Oh man, it, everybody's so good in this. Um, Anthony Hopkins uh, is great. Um, of course, the leads are Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn, um, both seasoned veteran actors. Both are amazing together. Like the star power is just overwhelming. And but just to see like a young, free Silence of the Lambs, Anthony Hopkins is like always kind of wild to me. Um, and uh there is a queer subplot with him which i thought was very cool and it like the first time i seen this I've, i saw this a couple of times because i really like it but the first time i, I was obviously very like taken up like taken back in, in how you perceive dealing with that subject is sort of up to you to decide um i don't know if it's as cringe as maybe it could have been especially for the early 60s but your mileage may vary. But I don't want to spoil too much about that. Um, but yeah, it's a great movie. It's very long. 
but I think it's one of the few movies that the world building and the acting is so good that I don't mind that extra time to let the characters breathe and to really get a sense of size and scale. Um, and I really like this bizarre, almost rekindling of the queen's affections for the king, even though he's done this awful, horrible stuff to her. Um, it's like strongly implied uh, she's been trying to like lead a coup and that's why she's like essentially a prisoner. Um, but then they have this kind of weird sort of like, again, like rekindling, which I think is interesting. Um, so yeah, it is like, this is definitely going in my Christmas movie pile. Um, it very much is a Christmas movie. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, it, it's it's set around Christmas time. They mention it a bunch. Plus, I mean, it, it is all those hallmarks of like awkward family Christmas is only like mm -hmm. amped up to like a billion. Um, so what what uh, what did you make out with the? Uh, it doesn't look like there's any new special features. I was trying to see if there was if this was a new like uh, like encode with like a Blu-ray 50 instead of Blu-ray 25, like some of these are. For I couldn't. They usually say that along with their announcements. They did not on this one. And from what I could see on Blu-ray.com, it seems like the original release was a Blu-ray 50 already. So this might just be an exact port over of the same disc. Um, so I think it's probably just the slip cover. But if it there could be. Uh, there's there's certainly been erroneous things listed on blu-ray.com before mm. so the original release might have been a blu-ray 50 uh but i'm not sure so it's probably the same disc but if yeah. if anything it's just like a minor encoding difference okay um it looks great like um you know i would say that it doesn't look spectacular but i mean there is a little bit of like artifacts there's a little bit of like maybe like the definition isn't at its best but i think overall it really looks nice like the colors and the costumes um really pop everything looks has a level of clarity that you come to expect from kino so all of that's great it's not perfect um i would love to see if they could actually do like a true 4k release of this which you know depending on what the elements are like maybe that's not possible but i think overall looks good sounds good um commentary's great um and then you have uh an interview uh and a trailer as as um rounding up the feature so not a lot but the commentary track alone is worth it and the movie's um so great uh if you haven't seen it and you just kind of want something that's like i don't know like if you i hate to harp on game of thrones but if you're like like that and you kind of are like jones in for something to like you know until house of dragon comes back i mean it's not a one-to-one -one. it's not a fantasy film but you do get that kind of backstabbing manipulation there's like a weird almost sort of like pseudo incestuous thing going on with like with the queen and like one of the sons like it has it all it really does um <laughs> it's just creepy enough the fact that the king is having sex with a, a woman that's also having sex with the son you know, I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. it's it's weird, but you know, you do you, King. But yeah, it's something. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, starting off with a doozy. Uh, I love this film. Um, Y'all should check it out if you haven't. It's it's great. Well, I will definitely take that advice. It's been one that's been on my watch list for a long time, and I guess now's the time to finally get to it. Um, my first uh, trio of releases, uh, I'm starting, I'm just jumping right into it. Um, so my my slate is incredibly stacked this week. Um, it's almost all 4K releases. So I've, it's been one heck of a week. But I'm this these trio of releases are arguably the biggest releases to come to physical media in some time. It's had so many people arguing on the internet and then this week they finally came out and people are losing their minds because it's like sold out everywhere and no one's getting their pre-orders on time so they're losing it but i'll just dig right into it i am digging into the james cameron 4k releases true lies aliens and the abyss uh so i'm not gonna go too much into the actual movie portion of these discs just because they are kind of iconic movies i'll kind of go over it lightly in my general impressions, but um, 
as as a whole concept, these three releases, uh, for those who don't know, uh, James Cameron has recently uh, remastered all three of these movies. And did he do a good job? Uh, if you ask the internet, you would probably hear no. And if you ask the average person who just like likes a crisp, shiny picture that looks like you're looking through a window, they'd be like, he nailed it. Uh, me personally, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I tend to lean more towards the dissenters, uh, but I, I'll kind of dig into it title by title. Um, the main thing is, uh, George, or I almost said George Lucas, because he's another one who t- tinkers with stuff. James Cameron is someone who has said in the past that he always wanted his movies to not have film grain. He wanted it to look like, like it's distracting. He wants it crisp and clear. So he used new AI technology to basically get rid of it and as much as possible, which is just like horrible to our ears as like film purists and everything. But he did it. It's his films. He does what he wants to, and we can judge it as it is. And overall, these releases are a bit of a mixed bag. I will just, I will kind of lead up to the better versions of this, but the worst of these three is True Lies, unfortunately. Uh, which is the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, action classic uh, where he plays a spy whose family doesn't know he's a spy. He just thinks he's just like a computer geek, which is amusing that they try to pull that off. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, his wife, Jamie Lee Curtis, kind of gets mixed up in the action uh, through means. And it's just a big action comedy time. Um, I think it's... It's not my favorite uh, Cameron film. I uh, One thing I've noticed throughout all of his movies is I don't think he's a really great script writer. Um, I think he's good with like general like themes and like overarching themes. So in terms of pure like dialogue, I don't think he has a really good, like handle on dialogue mostly, um, especially with some of these films, mostly True Lies, uh, but otherwise uh, in The Abyss a little bit too. Um, some of his characters are just like, wildly misogynistic and i'm just like cameron why why do you have to like build this into your script so much and it's just like there are just certain things that really pull me out of the movie yes there are some like I- iconic lines and true lines are true lies that are pretty amusing mostly by bill paxton some by tom tom arnold who's a little bit grating to me in this movie but uh bill paxton like he does a really <laughs> great job in this um but what I really like about this movie is the the, the dynamic between him, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jamie Lee Curtis and the very impressive action scenes. They are like some of the most impressive around this era. Like Cameron is really showing how to get it done. And as much as I do have certain criticisms of James Cameron, he really does know how to shoot an action scene. So what he doesn't know how to do is leave his films alone to look nice because this looks very processed and uh, just like not waxy looking necessarily but like just off just digitally off the skin like certain uh facades just look depending on the angle the lighting what have you just things look very artificial and it's just uh, it's just a, a little bit of an eyesore unfortunately if you do like that looking through the window quality and you're not bothered by kind of digital looking movies that should look like film you'll probably won't have a huge uh, issue with this, but there are a lot of people who are film like purists and want things to look natural that will not like this, but you'll still probably want to get this because it was never released on Blu-ray before. It's only been stuck on DVD. So you're kind of like stuck with this. If you want it on anything other than DVD, unless you want to import the Spanish bootleg Blu-ray, which I know a lot of people are, but um if, if you want this in high definition, uh, you kind of have to give the, get with this and live with it. Um, it does kind of make up for some of its video inconsistencies with the really impressive Dolby Atmos track. Um, and one thing I want to note is James Cameron does have enough clout to make Disney implement Dolby Vision on all three of these releases. They did the same with his Avatar re-releases. So for a company that pretty much never does it, I'm glad that at least Dolby Vision was implemented here even if the video itself like is a little bit not great. Um, but there are times where this looks passable, uh, but it just never looks great. You want these films to look great, like the best they ever have. And it, it just, 
to have this thing in the back of your mind where it doesn't look as good as it could is just a really of a bummer of an experience for for a release that people have been waiting for for decades. Like it's they've been wanting a really really great release of this, um, and I cannot say this is a great release. Um, it just does the job for people who want to upgrade from DVD. But it's not a home run by any stretch of the imagination. On all three of these releases, I'll be going much, much more in depth on my written reviews, which will be in the days following the release of this video. If you really want me to go in depth, video, audio, special features. But in terms of special features, there are there is a new um, 44 minute retrospective, which is really cool. Uh, new comments from Cameron Schwarzenegger, um, some like 2012 comments from Jamie Lee Curtis that were uh, kind of woven into here, but yeah, it's here in high definition. You have to deal, like, decide if it's uh, worth getting for you or not. Um, but a little bit better, still problematic, is Aliens, which is for some people their favorite Alien film. I might lean slightly more towards the Ridley Scott original, but this is a really great sequel. It's one of the best. Uh, Cameron knows how to direct the hell out of a sequel, <laughs> um, and. Uh, this, I forgot to mention, the True Lies is a two-disc release. This is a three-disc release, and they are stacked discs over here. It comes with a disc under the 4K disc, but I switched it to for the Blu-ray to be under the Blu-ray disc, so there's not as much chance of the 4K disc of getting scratched because it's a little bit more sensitive to the Blu-ray disc. I do the same with the, of the Abyss, and I'll kind of talk about that then. Um, but Aliens is a great expansion of the original story. It's much more action-packed and less... Um, steeped in like overt horror uh, like of the alien it's more just like bombastic and uh, uh turning ripley more into like a action hero badass and like a cunning badass as she is in the first movie um but i really love aliens uh this is a bit more this is the one of the three that i think people will most have to wrestle with if they want to upgrade because there was a previous blu-ray of this um, was it perfect? No, but I think it is. It wasn't as processed as this one. And this, this like True Lies, does have a great deal of processing, and um, you do kind of get that digital appearance throughout. There is like a semblance of like grain or fake film grain that is included, but it's just, it's once again just like a very inconsistent looking picture the dolby vision and the colors look very nice and the atmos track is very impressive but video wise it's just once again more so like what are you doing cameron why can't you leave this alone so um this includes both the uh, the special edition cut and the original theatrical cut in dolby vision and 4k and all that stuff um it has a whole disc of special features that carries over like a three hour plus documentary a ton of archival special features like lit like whenever i type it out it's like this long of special features there's an audio commentary track uh there's a way to view the uh, unique scenes in the special edition on like separately it's great so special features wise you cannot ask for more video wise i i'm asking for more um, but finally the best of the three is The Abyss. Um, does it have some of the same problems as the other two? Yes, but it is much less egregious on this one. And if you do only get one of these releases, I would say get The Abyss. Because um, while there is a process look to it, I think um, since True Lies is the one that's like most like in the daytime, I think it's the most uh, like... Uh, affected like and like obvious of the digital manipulation both aliens and the abyss are more so cloaked in shadow uh but the abyss especially i think holds up very well you do get the uh, uh perception of texture whether it be like fake digital grain or maybe a little bit of lingering grain that they, they missed through the ai cleanup but um it doesn't look like super off it's, like, there are moments that look a little bit off but overall um if you've been waiting like for decades for the abyss to like be in high definition it is not a complete disappointment it's just a little slightly a bit underwhelming compared to what we could get it but it looks often very nice so um of the three this definitely looks the best the atmos track is very impressive 
This does include both the original theatrical cut and the special edition, which runs about 30 minutes longer. I stuck with the special edition for, I had actually never seen The Abyss and I actually really liked it. I was under the impression that it was a horror movie and I was in for a surprise when I realized what it actually was. But I think it's a really cool movie and I, I understand why people have been like, requesting it for just like years and years and years it's all i've heard people being like i want the abyss on blu-ray i want the abyss, abyss on blu-ray it's finally here on 4k um and it's a really good movie and i think you need to watch if you are going to start with one watch this special edition because i think going back and looking how the original ends i think it just like clarifies so much about what is actually happening and i think the original ending just kind of leaves you being like oh what what why was why did this these certain things happen and so if you, it's long as hell it's almost three hours for the special edition but i think it's worth it overall um really good number of special features here as well like once again another like full page full of just archival special features and documentaries this does include some new special features including uh two new featurettes uh like a retrospective and like a like another appreciation piece that runs 33 and 25 minutes long plus an hour long archival documentary and a ton of other special features so the Abyss, I can recommend this, uh, especially since there's not a Blu-ray independently. Aliens, you kind of judge for yourself if you if you the Atmos track is enough and if you can handle some digital processing. And True Lies, you're going to want to get it because it's an HD option, but it, you're going to kind of begrudgingly watch it, I think, even though a lot of people, I think, will like it. So Cameron, you... You've made people buy a lot of things they're going to be very conflicted about. and But overall, I'm glad that they are here. It's just what they could have been could have been so much better. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, so I so my Abyss came because I pre-ordered those. Um, I pre-ordered that in True Lies. I didn't do Aliens yet, so I guess that's on back order from Amazon. Um, so um, my husband's never seen The Abyss, so we we're going to watch that probably this weekend um nice. yeah so i was like really curious like because i haven't had time to really like sit down and watch it yet and then um actually funny enough my uh copy of true life just shipped out earlier today so um mm -hmm. um i'm gonna keep my expectations low but i'm glad mm -hmm. that like you said glad it's you know still um uh, being um uh, re-released and maybe down the road we'll get like a better not as compromised i don't know version of it yeah. but um at least we have it in some format and not like mm -hmm. just dvd um but um my next one is um very different <laughs> um <laughs> it is uh mario bava's the whip in the body which was an early 60s uh bava film and um, if you don't know who Mario Bava was, he's very influential on like the Diallo and uh, genre. No reversible art. Like I said, I think I only think like one or two of these has that. But um, yeah, so this has Christopher Lee in it, and um, it's basically um, a very Todd Reese sort of soap opera about this sadistic guy played by Christopher Lee. Um, who is sort of manipulating this woman and she slowly I guess kind of reveals that she likes SM and he uh Christopher Lee dies but then oh maybe he's back from the dead and he's still looking to whip people um <laughs> it's really weird but um it very much has that like gothic um aesthetic that you kind of know Baba uh, for for like things like um Black Sunday and even like Black Sabbath his like his um anthology uh film and yeah it's it's pretty cool i think it's it definitely feels a little like Baba meets Hammer especially with Christopher Lee in it it's hard not to make that distinction um <laughs> i don't love that they don't kind of there's a weirdness that they don't really embrace which i don't like um like this idea of maybe like a horny supernatural kinky sort of angle 
is really fascinating, but they don't really um, lean into that. It's like, it feels like they just lean into like more like paint and play stuff and not enough of the old like whip whip, you know, kind of, I don't know. It, it's just, I, I, I don't like the ending too. The, I mean, I'm not going to spoil it, obviously, but I feel like the ending sort of negates a lot of the things that I did like about it with the setup. Mm -hmm. um, like it doesn't allow you as the audience to sort of in reinterpret things a little bit differently. It's very like concrete uh, in, in its ending, which that's fine. But I mean, it's just, again, I like stuff that um, is a little bit ambiguous. It doesn't have to spoon feed you everything, but um, I still think it's fun. I mean, Christopher Lee is uh, clearly having a blast as a as a sadistic villain. Um, it looks really good. So this also is another uh, Kino Studio Classics re-release. Um, I believe that this is also just another port over um, from the previous. Uh, this is <clears throat> one of the few Baba films that I had not previously owned uh on blu-ray so just like <clears throat> just like lion in winter uh i was really excited for this re-release and it looks really good too um <clears throat> again same thing with lion in winter it's not a perfect um restoration there is um this one fares maybe a little bit worse as far as like some artifacts and debris and stuff but <laughs> excuse me but um it overall looks really nice. And again, Bava is sort of known for his very um, flamboyant um, flourishes with colors and set design. So it is nice seeing that looking, um, you know, it does have a level of really good, good clarity. It's just not, it's not perfect. Um, and the commentary track um, you get uh, with Tim Lucas, which I know for sure is a port over. Um, that almost might be a port over from like the Anchor Bay uh, box set <coughs> um, and it also has an original Italian dub and a English, uh, a English dub and you know we're always dubs before dubs but it gives you that option and it also comes with a trailer so maybe not the most spectacular uh, um, array of features but it's fine the movie's um the movie's fine. It's not one of my, it's by far not one of my favorite, uh, favorite Baba films. Uh, again, I'm used to Baba being really crazy and wild. Like I think about stuff like Bay of Blood, which is like the granddaddy of all like slasher films. Um, but I just feel like this sort of pulled a lot of punches and it feels very studio mandated um, in kind of how it handles its subject. So um, it's fine. It's just I'm glad that it got a re-release because um, again, this was a Bob film that I had had not had in my collection. So, yeah. Um, have you seen this one? No, I know you've been trying to slowly get me into more Baba stuff over the last couple <laughs> years or so, but uh, I haven't been able to check that one out yet. Yeah, I mean, I would like soft recommend. It's if. You know, if you're going to skip some Baba, this one's kind of skippable, in my opinion. Like, it has some fun moments, but it's, yeah, it's kind of meh. <laughs> what a glowing recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, yeah. Uh, well, on, on the heels of that, uh, I do have one I, I want to recommend. Um, this is a new one from the Criterion Collection. I was very excited to check this out. Um, this is the 4K Ultra HD release of to Die For uh, from Gus Van Sant with Nicole Kidman. Uh, my wife uh, claims she has a power to manifest 4K releases because she says every time that she watches something, like within a few months or a year, they'll release a 4K. And we just watched this last year, so we're right on track here. Uh, but uh, so you can thank her for any 4K releases. Usually we've watched them recently. Um, here is a booklet here. I uh, like how it's uh, looking looking like a newspaper, and you can get the the fold out essay here, and the back uh, some information here. 
Um, yeah, uh, and it's, it's a pretty good essay um, from uh, Jessica King, who uh, she's a really good film critic, and I uh, I believe she's based in the UK. I see her on Twitter all the time. She always has some really great good insights. Um, but uh, To Die For is came at a period for Nicole Kidman where she was trying to kind of branch out more. She was still married to Tom Cruise, but, but she was trying to like kind of prove herself like as like a, a formidable actress on her own. And boy, did she with this one because she kind of, this is a kind of a crime dramedy kind of comedy, like weird, like black, black comedy where uh, she plays a woman who is uh, from the beginning. You can tell that she is like, uh, she has a spotlight on her as someone who uh, has like, she's very ambitious. She wants to be on television. She wants to be a reporter. Um, and uh, she also happens to have a, a dead husband to her name. And there's just kind of a little bit of mystery of like how he actually ended up dead. And there's like people giving like testimonials throughout the movie, just uh, testifying to her character and her ambition and all this stuff. And this isn't just a, like a, crazy woman movie it is more about uh obsession with fame and media like uh sensationalism uh like this the ways that people kind of go and will manipulate truth in order to like get what they want um and this character played by nicole kidman she's a very fascinating character you can tell she's troubled but she's also been uh, raised in an environment that kind of puts that value on like being someone, being newsworthy, uh, which is something that's very relevant to today. So I think this is like, this was made in the nineties, but it's just as relevant today for people who are like doing like stupid things on TikTok or doing like spreading rumors or just like, just having like a look at me type of reaction, which I think even by doing this show, we're kind of doing, but just like everyone kind of feeds into this little, this beast. So this is a very timely movie and Nicole Kidman is fantastic. This has a ton of really uh, great performers uh, from like Ileana Douglas, a very young Joaquin Phoenix, a young Casey Affleck, uh, uh, Matt Dillon is in this. Uh, there's a really great assortment of uh, performers and Gus Van Sant really like toes the line between like comedy and drama and it's just it really works very well there's a, even a really cool cameo from david cronenberg which i even just having watched it a year ago i kind of forgot he was in this and he showed up i was like whoa what are you doing here so that's pretty cool um so yeah it's it's a really smart wicked satire that really i think still like holds up all these years later um and this 4k release is great um uh, this was previously released on blu-ray through image entertainment that has long been out of print. I think it was going for some insane prices on eBay. Criterion swooping in and being like, no, don't pay those prices. We'll re-release it on Blu-ray and also give it a new 4K release. So this has been given a new 4K restoration, supervi supervised by Gus Van Sant in Dolby Vision. It looks fantastic. Natural film, which is unlike something I just talked about, but it looks natural. It looks great. It's resolved well. No damage or anything. It just looks nice and vibrant and the Dolby Vision looks very nice from either like both in the kind of tropical beach colors to the wintry like snowy climate both look very nice uh, 5.1 soundtrack there is a new audio commentary track from Gus Van Sant and the editor and the cinematographer there's also a new assortment of special features that runs 36 minutes i believe yes 36 minutes most of these are unfinished some do not even have audio um but uh and they're kind of in rough shape but this is footage that's never before been seen so you get to if you're a fan of the movie that's a really cool extra other than that there's no special features besides the trailer so in terms of like criterion releases it's a little bit lighter than some but you do get a couple of new special features which are pretty cool and the film looks the best it ever has so if you're a fan of this film definitely get it um, and since the previous Blu-ray is out of print, this is like the way to watch it now without paying like an arm and a leg. And I think it's worth it. It's fun. So to die for from the Criterion Collection. Nice. Um, yeah, that's one that I think is very underrated. Um, yeah, it is great. Um, I'm glad that it's finally getting a really nice re-release. People can um, be able to check it out, uh, as you said, like not pay these crazy like prices. And I think like, it was maybe kind of hard. Well, I think it was like streaming off and on, but 
it's just nice mm -hmm. to have that really nice looking 4K. So um, my next title is another um, Kino Studio re-release. And this was another one that um, I had not previously owned. Um, and that is uh, Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dynamite, a.k.a. Duck You Sucker. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is the one that has the recording art. Yeah. Which I like this one better. Um, but both of these are, are pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I I don't think it's like a shocker to say that like out of all of like the Sergio Leone um spaghetti westerns, um, this was definitely my least favorite, but then that's like relatives when you're considering movies like um a fistful of dollars and a few dollars more and the good the bad and the ugly like all of those are legitimate masterpieces in their own right um so that's yeah that's a pretty high bar but this is a really fun movie and i think it's really interesting because um it folds in the uh mexican revolution into the plot and uh you know, I don't know, like the director never really liked that people sort of tried to use this as an analogy for what was going on around the country at the time in the early 70s. Um, I guess this just was a backdrop of the plot with no greater meaning. But I don't know. Um, believe that or not, um, I think that you, I don't know, setting it during wartime and then like... Um, not saying it's not a commentary on any kind of current conflict maybe is a little dubious but whatever um yeah so um it's a fun movie it's very fast paced um it is very long though um but the action is almost non-stop like the first few minutes we get the line the titular duck you sucker line which is really fun it's like he like plants this thick of dynamite and um yeah it's it's crazy um like i think this artwork kind of conveys how like insane this movie gets um yeah again very snappy uh you get that great style that leone was known for area um mcconey did the uh score which like his scores for the um the dollars trilogy was like pretty much famous um anytime anybody kind of hums a few bars of like some of his themes like you immediately associate that with westerns you know that was all uh, marconi so yeah um very awesome movie very fun um maybe a little too long for my liking but um yeah it's um it's definitely a little bit lighter in tone i i would think in in terms of like the other the only films and i kind of wonder if that was like uh very like purposeful um because uh as you know there's humors in his other films like that but you know it can take you into some very dark bleak places um and this one has a little bit more of a buddy kind of cop sort of like duo uh feel to it and uh, i don't know i like that um it's a nice sort of change of pace again I think the other movies hold up a little bit better for me. Um, but yeah, it's just nice to have this in, in your collection. Uh, so this has two commentary tracks, which is really great. Um, we get six featurettes, uh, image gallery, radio spots, and trailers. So we do get a really nice array of features. I believe this, this was all port overs from um, Kino's previous release of this, which I had not owned. So I couldn't tell you if it's like a new restoration it looks really nice, though. Again, I think out of all of these so far, um, this is the restoration that I think holds up the best, uh, in my opinion. Colors really pop. Uh, they use a lot of outdoor scenes, and those look absolutely gorgeous. Um, not a lot in a way of, like, debris or artifacts. Um, everything has a really nice, sharp clarity to it. Um yeah, so probably fares the best, like I said, out of all these so far. I have one more title to talk about, which, uh, you know, will definitely be the best. But yeah, um, 
if you're a fan of the other Leone Spaghetti Westerns and you don't have this in your collection, uh, you know, now is a great time. And again, if you want the slipcover, order early uh, so you will get that. Yeah, you just described me. I'm a fan and I do not own it. So it uh, seems like that's <laughs> the, a good release for me. I am sad that they couldn't make the 4K release that they initially announced happen. But I, mm -hmm. I think the like the restoration they said would be like too much like cost too much and like all the elements were all over the place so a re-release is at least good for us now um my next title i know a lot of people are very excited about this i already talked about one trilogy i'm here to talk about another trilogy um much a little bit less acclaimed um uh consistently uh this is from screen factory and this is the ring collection on 4k uh, so my history with this franchise is I watched the first one a little over 20 years ago, whenever it came out to DVD. Um, and I remember being at the time a little bit underwhelmed. Uh, I know that everyone flipped their shit over this movie and thought it was the scariest thing, but I think I was just like, kind of like a young, like preteen that i just was kind of like it's fine blah 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 and i just kind of put it out of my mind until now <laughs> uh but re-watching this and i actually really like the ring i think it's a really good horror movie uh and uh i think naomi watts does a really good job in both of her two ring movies um and i like well i don't i don't find it to be terrifying um, I think it's a really, like, most of the horror movies that I really love, like, I don't really find any of them, like, super terrifying, but I usually find them engaging on, like, a narrative level, or there's something thematically that's really speaking to me that, uh, past the initial, like, tense moment, upon rewatches, I still get just as much because there's something underlying that I just really connect with, um, but The Ring is like that, I like, kind of, she's uh, a mother who is trying to protect her son and and there's like this cursed videotape where like everyone knows it like you watch it you get a phone call afterwards it says like seven days you're gonna die in seven days and you're kind of stuck with, with that curse but this i like this is mostly like an investigative thriller she's just trying to like track down like different leads and trying to figure out what she can do before these seven days are up uh and i it's just very effective. Gore, Gore Verbinski, he directed this. And I think he just has a really good handle of like having like some really uh, evocative stakes and just uh, some really dis uh, disquieting like imagery. There's a lot of like disturbing imagery in this. And yes, the, the ending is iconic, but even like outside of that, it's a pretty creepy movie. And I think it like sets the atmosphere very well. The second movie, which I know is much much less acclaimed uh i'm gonna have some controversial takes on this trilogy i'll just say that um i actually like the second movie i think it's pretty decent it's it's different i think it's a little bit mo more focused uh, slightly more on the horror aspect uh but I, di I didn't mind how it developed it's not as good as the first one but um i like that the director of the original ring movies from japan he came over to direct the ring 2 um I don't the studio didn't give them full control um so they there's kind of a there is an unrated cut on this it's a little bit closer to his actual vision um but even the theatrical cut i found to be like entertaining if not like as successful as the first movie um but i think it's not like a huge step down from the first one i just think it's like a minor step down but and then in the the third one rings um everyone hates this movie I didn't mind it. I think it's I think it's passable as like kind of your kind of Blumhouse level, like medium tier Blumhouse like thing that you kind of forget. It's not quite level to the artistic ambition of the first two movies. It is more just kind of a throwaway horror movie, but as kind of like junk food horror. I didn't completely mind rings. I like I like the concept of try like uh the morality of like trying to pass off the curse to someone and like like whether or not you, they kind of explore that at the beginning of the second movie but just kind of like 
giving someone the curse knowingly instead of just stumbling upon it and just how people kind of manipulate the curse and how that eventually evolves in rings and there's a really like fun like cheesy like scenery chewing uh performance from vincent d'onofrio in rings which uh i, I like seeing vincent d'onofrio so it, uh i didn't mind it i know a lot of people will be like that's a trash opinion i don't care it's it's a de it's a decent enough movie so i don't feel it is like fouling up this trilogy 4k release uh which is, is a fantastic set and i think fans will be very happy if they've been waiting for this i know paramount released a, like a steel book a couple years ago that we were like interested in getting but now that i didn't get that and i waited to rewatch this with the 4k release i'm very glad i did um because the first two movies have been given a 4k restoration from the original camera negative the first movie has been overseen or, or overseen and approved by gore verbinski and I know I was reading a lot about the Blu-ray release of The Ring, and apparently it had a much more green push to things, and like it really rubbed people a lot the wrong way. This new restoration kind of shifts it back more to the blue side of the color spectrum. So it has that blue color gray that I think was originally intended, and it just looks fantastic in Dolby Vision. It's like very like film light um if it resolves well nice nuanced colors like really great detail within like some of the like the grotesque special effects work and like whenever you see samara and like her hair like you can kind of see all the details of her hair and stuff it's just great the second one also looks fantastic and it is even more impressive because it never got a blu-ray release it's just jumping from dvd to 4k and it looks fantastic the theatrical cut is the one on 4k both cuts are on the Blu-ray, um, and I, from what I could tell, the the unrated cut, uh, the scenes blend pretty well. Like you don't see like a large variance in the footage. I just don't think they wanted to sh like give money out for like an like a HDR grade uh, pass on it. So I'm a little bit disappointed that you couldn't get both cuts in 4K. But the uncut on Blu-ray looks very nice. So fans will be happy to at least have that on Blu-ray and the film in HD at all, um, if there are fans out there. <laughs> uh, but in Rings, it's a newer release. It came out like 12 years after the second one. And so it's it was more in the digital capture realm. So this is a 4K master in Dolby Vision. So it is not as much of like a night and day difference as the other two movies. It's just a, like... A 4K master looking as good as it possibly can on 4K. There's a lot of scenes in darkness, so you have really deep dark black levels, uh, no like blown highlights, nice detail. Everything looks very nice, and um, all these are given DTS 5.1 soundtracks, except for Rings that it bumps it up to a DTS 7.1. Um, all of them sound really good um, in terms of special features. Um, it seems to port over almost all the original special features. I think people were noting that the there may have been a way to watch uh, the the cursed video video on the original Blu-ray that's not included here, from what I can tell. Um, but what it does give you is a new 93-minute documentary on the Ring franchise and bringing it from Japan to America. I think it's called like. Ghost Girls, Girl, Ghost Girl Gone Global. It's a very impressive documentary. Um, just looking at the Ring franchise, which is, I love stuff like that. It's a really good documentary. Um, you also get a new commentary track from like uh, some film historians on the Ring 2. So you get a new commentary on that one. There's no new special features on Rings, but the, all the uh, special features from the original release have been ported over. So if you're a fan of this branch of the American version of this franchise, you get all three of those in here looking the best they ever have sounding great with a good number of special features, all with their own cases. So like you don't have to worry about the packaging, which is pretty cool too. Um, overall fantastic set from screen factory. I know this was originally supposed to come out at the end of last year, but any delays that uh, this incurred, it was worth it. It's a very good set. Nice. Um, yeah, I was a little, little bit disappointed they didn't have the original added to that, but like the the original uh, Japanese film. Um, is there any rumblings if they're maybe doing that as a separate? Because I know that was a theory. Like, um, I know the the first Ring film is actually on 4K from Era Video that came out last year. 
Um, okay. And then the rest, of, there's like a Ring Ringu collection that Arrow put out on Blu-ray, but I haven't heard about the rest of the Japanese movies being upgraded to Blu-ray or 4K at least. Yeah, um, yeah that's, um, I checked. It's also not that much right now, like 60 bucks for the entire set, which is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um so I'm like switching gears for now um, from Kino and I'm um, pivoting over to Warner Archive and that is Cabin in the Sky, um, which is a Vincent Minnelli um, film. A lot of uh, really great special features, but I'll get into that later. Um, so there, um, I think we've talked about this before, but now there's disclaimer um from warner brothers uh just kind of talking about uh a lot of the problematic uh racial stereotypes and and things going on in this movie and i think that's kind of the best way to go about doing something like this uh because you want to put it in that proper context but at, at the same time you don't necessarily want to hide it away either um i'm Mm -hmm. looking at you disney song of the south um and yeah it's complicated but i think that's kind of the the it's a damned if you do damned if you don't right like it's just you're not going to please everybody but i think that's the way to do it but anyways um yes those elements are very uncomfortable to watch um if you can't separate yourself from that i I completely understand. Um, if you can, however, um, it's a really charming, fun film. I like, I really love the musical numbers. I love the fantasy element to it. I love that the sort of like angels, devils, all that things kind of gave me like a Pressburger and Powell kind of thing where they would do things like that with like very lofty kind of concepts. Um, but in a way, it's it just oh, the soundtrack and the music makes this movie. It's so great. Louis Armstrong plays, um, I think it was like Lucifer Jr. Um, and that's amazing. Uh, this is sadly, it's one of the few movies back then that had a full African American cast. Um, I was reading, I wanted to do a little bit more homework on this, and um, they even consulted the um. NCAA, um, NAACP. Yes, sorry. Um, yes, just to make sure that the script was not cringy and not super stereotypical. I mean, it 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 still is, but I guess maybe for the time that was progress. But anyways, uh, you know, I'm obviously not the greatest person to speak on that, but as a film buff, it's good to at least have some representation and trying. So, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. The uh, film itself was Oscar nominated. Uh, I don't think it won. But yeah, I mean, the the cast and the, the musicians that they got is just unbelievable. Um, and it actually was pr- uh, pretty much a hit. Like it was made for uh, six hundred thousand uh, plus dollars, which is like nothing now um, mm-hmm. and uh, grossed almost two million dollars. So. Um, that's good because, you know, unfortunately there were some cities, uh, that would not show this film, um, because people are off. Um, and unfortunately that's still the case, maybe not as much, but yeah, it's a great movie though. Um, I love Vince Minnelli. I love his stuff. Um, this also, um, I guess maybe was, they gave a co-director credit to Bugsley Berkeley who did like the um of course like the musical numbers and that's always amazing and a big selling point so there's so many really cool fun things going on for this movie um you should really check it out if you haven't or um again if you really like vincent minnelli or bugsley berkeley and you want that like added to your collection uh here we go um i haven't owned this before but like i'm assuming just like other warner archive titles this one probably blows the DVD out of the waters. Um, it looks beautiful. Um, again, it's a very visually interesting movie. And just having all of these huge African-American um, 
actors and musicians in in one sort of setting is amazing just so just to see that this crisp beautiful new restoration is is great um i this i was gonna say this more towards the end because those are like my favorite but um yeah this one just made me happy and i loved watching it and i i i'm getting more into musicals um i know like you're more the um musical guy but yeah no it's um it's good you've you've seen this one right this is one that looks like a yeah little... i can yeah, I copied this on the channel a couple months ago, but yeah, I, I I quite liked it. I think it's Manelli's debut feature, if I remember correctly. And uh, I like a few like about a month or so before I watched the movie, I actually listened to a "You Must Remember This" about Lena Horn. So I I heard about this film, and then they like announced it like the next week through Warner Archive. I was like, ooh, how uh how fortuitous! And I I quite liked it. It's it's a really interesting like devil on your shoulder type movie like trying to figure out whether or not you're gonna like sub succumb to temptation or be a good person and how it shakes out i think it's a really solid movie my next title uh i since i just covered the ring collection i thought i'd just keep on with the j horror and go to arrow videos 4k release of dark water uh from hideo nakata if i'm uh not pronouncing that correctly my apologies this is actually the, the director i was discussing for the ring 2 because uh the american ring 2 because he this is the director of the original ring films he uh, transitioned to over to dark water after he did a couple of those um does this yeah it has a, a reversible cover art which i'll show off um uh, but I had seen the American remake of this in theaters back in the day uh, with Jennifer Connelly, which I still need to get a Blu-ray of that. I have not done so, but I remember liking it pretty well. Um, but I kind of just remembered vague beats of things. Um, here is the reversible cover art here. Um, and then that's kind of what it looks like on the booklet here. Um, so I was interested to finally check out the where that came from, um, the the original Japanese version. You got a nice essay in here and transfer notes and everything. Um, and I actually had picked up this the Blu-ray from Arrow Video a couple of years ago at like a thrift shop. They had it like randomly like at a place I never find Arrow films and i was like, oh, I'll get this. But of course, being me, I kind of like got it and put it away for like a a rainy day and i just never got around to it so then they released this and i'm like okay i so i just kind of gave it back to the thrift store and got this <laughs> um but uh as a film i think it it's not i don't think it's going for pure horror and knowing kind of like watching the ring two and like learning a little bit about nakata i think he he is not as focused on like scaring the shit out of you he is more uh, like interested in like themes and like exploring different facets of like humanity um and this story is like a about a mom and a daughter and like the mom is going through a divorce with her husband it's a little bit contentious she is moving into a new apartment building and there's it's just kind of a little bit run down there's always like a leaking ceiling seemingly everywhere in the apartment and just supernaturally so her life is kind of in disarray and there's like uh, whispers about like a, a child that had like disappeared in the years prior and this kind of all wraps up into like her dealing with her personal life and like trying to take care of her daughter and make sure she is like treated well while trying to like maintain her sanity and figure out what's happening. And uh, I like this movie. <laughs> this isn't for impatient audiences, I would say, because it's very much like it builds up. It's kind of like unsettling nature. It's a very rainy movie. It's like very atmospheric. You're just kind of like following this almost domestic drama throughout uh, just a woman trying to keep it together. And then you slowly get like flashes of different things. You'll see like the woman going down like an elevator. And then you see like a flash of like as things are about to like go out of view, like a pair of feet, like in the distance of a hallway that kind of like, did you, did, was that actually what I saw type of thing? And you just kind of see different flashes of that throughout. Like it's like building and building, but it's never like 
overtly like ah like jumping at you all the time it's just very it's building upon a foundation of like uh being unsettled until you get to the end which even itself the ending i don't remember the american version being a subtle because this is very much like it does feel kind of like a like a the ending of a domestic drama where it's like it's bittersweet it's kind of like it has like a touching element to it but it's also kind of heartbreaking and there is some un, like scary stuff um in terms of like some of this like makeup effects work and like the the entity that is haunting this building and this family but it's not like the most terrifying film i think it works very well from like a dramatic standpoint which is all like as i was saying with the ring trilogy often what i respond to the most so dark water i think is a pretty solid j horror movie i haven't watched the original ring to see how it compares but Overall, I think this is pretty solid. And um, this new 4K release, it looks very nice. The, like I said, I did not watch the original Blu-ray and I should have once I heard about before I traded it in. Because uh, according to online reports, it looked awful. And this new restoration looks fantastic. So I don't, I hear it, it is a major upgrade. I, I forgot to compare it before I traded it off. But this new 4K restoration looks chef's kiss it looks very nice it's just it's just uh, completed um uh by the japanese uh, production company uh last year it looks very nice just nice natural film grain rich colors dolby vision looks nice it's just a really really fantastic release it has a it carries over to all the interviews of the original release including a 2016 interview with the director and then even older interviews like Stuff that runs from anywhere from like 10 to 25 minutes long. So it's a good number of interviews in here. So if you're a fan of J-Horror, Dark Waters uh, on 4K, it's a pretty good release. Was this a limited edition one or was it just like maybe the slipcover was the the limited yeah. time? It's just, yeah, this is the first pressing. It's just the slipcover and the booklet okay. and stuff. This is like a chipboard box like some yeah. of the releases get. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, yeah, um, I, I I like that movie. It, you're right. You're so spot on. It is very. It's it's a very melancholy kind of horror film. Mm -hmm. Like it's just very drab and depressing. But it, again, I I like it. It really builds that creepiness that you know eventually mm -hmm. gets into it. Um, so what what do you, did you like the remake better than this one, or what do you think? Well, I haven't watched the Dark Water remake since it was in theaters, which was probably like 15 years ago. Okay. <laughs> but uh, just based on the fact that I love Jennifer Connelly, I probably at the time liked the remake more. But if yeah. I watched it again now, I'd probably see how it like kind of messes with the source material, knowing that it's an American remake and probably misses some of the nuances. I don't remember it being as heartbreaking as the original is, but I, once again, well, I've watched like, several thousand movies in the last 15 <laughs> years so i can't quite remember the specifics yeah no that's fair enough yeah. i was just kind of curious um yeah i recently watched both almost back to back and i mean the originals of course is better um not a shocker um i do i don't know the american remake just doesn't have that like it doesn't wallow in that misery that the original does so i don't know mm -hmm. But, you know, um, my next one is a horror movie, but very, very different. It's an Indonesian horror movie um, called Special Silencer. And that's what that's what that guy is. He's one of the silencers. Um, so here's the back. Um, so, OK, <laughs> um, I love Indonesian horror films. I think they're awesome. Um, they're very weird. Um I think Mystics in Bali is probably the most famous one and the most amazing one. Um, but I don't know. This one runs a close second. This one's really fun. Um, so um, the plot of which there is, is basically there is a man scheming for political power and he is using uh, these um, special pills that are supposed to help you meditate but in the wrong hands, um, it will spring forth these red tentacle monster things. Um, you know, 
So he's like, all right, I'm going to put these in people's food or drink. Apparently you can't taste it. You can't smell it, but like it will chest burst out of you. Um, so there seems to be easier ways to kill people. Um, and, and mm-hmm. it's compounded by the fact that these like special sort of like pills is like something you could only get from like a guru or a master or something. And how he obtained his was he like betrayed and killed his master and took these. Um, again, like maybe just use a gun or like hire somebody to, I don't know. It's, but that's what I love about these movies. Like they're so wacky and weird. Um, it's a nice mixture of, um, the Indonesian, like black magic, um, horror, but then you also have like a lot of martial arts elements. And, um, I think this mixes that pretty well like there are some other films that like um are very kung fu and martial arts um forward but then it has that horror element um it's so weird and like pacing wise i think like we get one of these things in the first 10 minutes so you really don't have to wait before you get into some weird wackiness um some of it gets a little bit um a little bit of a slog um and it's 90 minutes and it sometimes feels a little bit longer, but yeah, you just kind of live uh, between these like really weird, surreal moments. And the, the fighting scenes are actually really well done and pretty decent. So I, I liked it. I, um, Mono Macabre never um, puts out something that I'm not at least enjoying on some level. Um, we do have a nice, um, extended version um and then we have like a commentary track which gives a lot of really nice cultural um uh context for the film and um we also get um a uh extended version of mono macabre's episode on indonesian cinema and i mean i think that's kind of the crown jewel on this disc the special limited edition that's already sold out has a booklet um, this does not come with that. It's just the standard edition. But also, if you want something that's a little bit nicer on the price, um, it's everything that's on this disc. You just don't get um, the booklet. But it's good. It's it's a fun movie. It's weird. I love it. Um, I love how it kind of rips off the chest burster uh, in not super subtle ways. Um, yeah, I just, I adore weird shit like this, So. Special Silencers, another great film from Mondo. I have another Mondo title coming up, which I didn't like as much. But yeah, this one's more Indonesian horror, uh, please. <laughs> that one sounds quite interesting. I might have to check that one out. So I'm, I'm through all of my really wordy reviews, like all my big ones where I have to talk for way too long. Um, so I'm heading into my stretch of I have three Shout Studios titles, which I'm excited about. Uh, and, but my first one I'm going to talk about um, is uh, The Lost City of Z, or as they would say in the film, The Lost City of Zed. Uh, but I'm just I'm just doing it as it's as it's written, uh, because uh, this is a movie. I believe it came out in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has old Charlie Hunnam in here, um, has Robert Pattinson in a smaller role, Sienna Miller, and Tom Holland, Spider-Man himself, also has another uh, small role in this. And this is directed by James Gray, who did like Ad Astra um, and We Own the Night. Um, he's a really great director. He usually does stuff in New York City, uh, but he, this was kind of his first foray into like uh, a period piece um this is a actual true life story of an explorer uh this was like in the early 1900s or late 1800s somewhere along that it's it spans several decades of a man who is like trying to work his way up through like british nobility and like trying to make a name for himself and he 
is tasked with going to Bolivia, I believe. Uh, he's like a cartographer that he can like create a map of this that can help quell a like a land dispute between these two countries because uh, there needs to be more defined borders because this is still at the time where we don't have complete maps so we have to like explore this really turns into a tale of how they describe this in the special features a little bit i think is quite apt so i'll steal it from them i'll admit i'm stealing from them but it's more like a a more realistic indiana jones he learns about the potential of this like kind of lost civilization and no one back in at home besides his family and wife and stuff wants to believe him so he kind of develops this obsession with finding this lost city and it, it leads him on like this expedition with like a small crew and meeting different native um like uh, indigenous people and just like trying to figure out what is out there and like the possibilities and trying to expand. It, it's about the the wonders of exploration. And I think it really handles that very well. It also deals a little bit with like the first world war kind of dealt like has some side plots into that. Um, but it is mostly about kind of like obsession and exploration and family and how that kind of all intertwines. Charlie Hunnam is a person, an actor who has been very inconsistent. I, I liked him on Sons of Anarchy, even though like it didn't require a lot from him. He's really great in like Guy Ritchie movies, like The Gentleman. Um, and but I think this might just be his best performance so far. Um, he's very good in this. Robert Pattinson, he's in it quite a bit, but it's a very kind of low key role, and he's definitely not the spotlight of this. Same with Tom Holland, who shows up in like the last forty minutes of the movie. They don't like make a big like super big impact but they all do well within their roles the cinematography is stunning it is uh darius kanji uh shot this and he's a fantastic fantastic cinematographer a lot of natural light reminiscent of something like the revenant in terms of visual styles except more in the like the jungles instead of like i i see tundras um but yeah, I think it's a solid movie. It's a good period piece. If the concept of like exploring new lands and all the perils of like being on like an unstable river and meeting tribes that might want to kill you and all that stuff interests you, Lost City of Z is a good one. I previously owned this on Blu-ray that they put out through Broad Green Pictures. That company is now shuttered. Um, and But they, Shout Studios picked up the license for this and um released it on 4k also if you want to try this out i believe it is also a prime video original is one of one of their first films that they had on the platform so you can check this out on prime video the last i saw it was still on there if you wanted to try before you buy uh but this 4k release it comes from a 2k interpositive which i have heard rumor was that the original film elements may or like 4k digital intermediate may have been over in the uk and they didn't have access to it but i will say if you didn't know that background i don't think you would really notice i think it's just a really nice looking 4k transfer it was shot on film but like finished on digital and it looks very nice it's just like rich colors deep black levels it's not like incredible but it's such a striking looking movie that it looks really nice on 4k but i'm not sure if it's like a night and day difference from the blu-ray um so if you don't have it the 4k is the way to experience it if you can still find the blu-ray and it's like dirt cheap may you might not notice a big difference but i like the 4k release and it comes in dolby vision looks very nice um and yeah uh, it does come with a audio commentary from james gray it's quite uh, informative other than that there's like two three minute featurettes it's really kind of just like puff promotional pieces but um yeah it's a solid movie i think it's worth checking out if you like it a lot the 4k it's a really nice release nice that's kind of an excuse to check finally check that out because i've heard that it's really good especially since he's like making other really good movies lately um I mm -hmm. wish that I could say my next one was a good movie, but it is not. Um, it is, um, well, so this is uh, my second um, thing from Mondo Macabre is Death Squad. Although I had a hard time finding this movie because it is listed under IMBD as um, Brigade of Death. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So this kind of reminded me of a little bit of a like Polizia film. Uh, it has that very hard edge, no nonsense, very grimy, almost like a Polizia film, sort of like meets a little bit of like Bill Lustig as far as like his like grimy New York films. Um, the problem with this is it is very transphobic and homophobic mm -hmm. and also like not very kind to sex workers. Yeah, it just kind of hits all of those things like. It's a, um, again, police film, but it's a revenge film, but the villain is queer coded. All of the victims are um, people that are intersexed, which uh, they definitely don't use that nice of a, a term. So yeah, I'll let you fill in the blanks. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, for me, it made it kind of a slog to get through. It's just, it's very mean-spirited it doesn't have sort of like the fun charms of um special silencers it's just a very gruff mean no nonsense um uh, revenge film and i don't know i didn't love it the director um uh, i've heard of before he is kind of known for these sort of grimy sort of um sexploitation films and, you know, he has a bit of a following, so that's kind of cool if you are into his movies. I'm not saying, like, you have to be upset by the things that I am, obviously. But it just, it was not a enjoyable ride. I kind of hated watching it, and I was very happy when it was over. Um, we do get um, not a huge amount of features. Um, we do get a new interview with the a couple of the actors in an original um trailer but yeah it's I, I don't know i like mondo i love that it's at least out but this just wasn't really it for me but um yeah i mean it looks good um again not a lot of features but um just having an obscure film out on blu-ray looking nice is always great but it just didn't connect yeah, uh, I hate whenever like a label you trust just kind of like misses and you're just like, Ugh, oh, that's too bad. But they'll get you at the next one. So <laughs> um, my next title uh, is probably one of the lower points of my slate, but it's still one like this isn't a good movie. I will just say that. But I did have fun with it. So <laughs> take take that as you will. Um, on some level, I did. Um, this is the 90s action thriller surviving the game with Ernest uh, from Ernest Dickerson who did a uh, juice which we've talked about on the uh the show before uh this has a interesting cast I'll just say it stars Ice T Rutger Hauer uh John C McGinley uh uh Gary Busey F Murray Abraham Charles Dutton <laughs> like wild cast uh especially gary Busey. it's fun um but um what this is it's a remake of the classic most dangerous game um it is uh ice t plays a homeless man uh who has like a uh uh mysterious past of like trauma but you can kind of if you've seen any movies with a man with like a mysterious past uh, trauma, you can pretty much guess what has happened to him, but he's living on the streets these days and he kind of gets scoped out by a man. Uh, he's like kind of on his last string and he gets recruited to help this hunting party do like some scouting. And then once he gets there after a little bit of like bonding with the men, uh, the next day, whenever the hunting is about to start, he learns that he is the prey uh so he kind of gets a head start and then he has like this kind of like a survival thriller like of these men who like these rich assholes who every year just go out and they hunt uh like a homeless person that they think is trash and just blah blah and it's it's a it's a social satire it's kind of like screw the rich like eat, like eat the rich they're awful blah blah um is this like the most effective interpretation of this source material no it is not um it is very blunt it is very like action oriented like lots of ex 
explosions and people like this is a really really gnarly movie at times and that's what i'm having the most fun with it is whenever like these du- dudes are getting their comeuppance and maybe like sliced in half and like disemboweled and just like blown up in different ways it's i'm i'm laughing in delight it's just a fun time but is it like a great movie no i think the kind of stumbling block like their initial stumbling block of this is the casting of ice t as your lead because as much as like i like ice t as a personality as like a figure who we just kind of know is he a strong actor no and i think like with a different actor in the lead role i think it could have been a little bit more interesting rutger howard's doing some great a scenery chewing uh, f murray abraham's like an like huge like dick who's just like doing his most like hoity-toity like derision of homeless people and uh, everyone in between they're just like they're all the all the assholes are at their most assholishness and they're doing good but ice T just kind of like he's not quite like enough in the action star realm to make that point believable and he's not enough in like the dramatic range to make his like trauma like really emotionally uh, like evocative so it was a little bit emotionally hollow, but but still fun in a way that you can like enjoy just mindless action and people like getting what's coming to them. You get the blunt satire, but it's less like we've seen this before and you kind of understand. But I guess it was a little bit more relevant in the 1920s when it was originally published. But this is a story that gets remade like every decade or two. It just, it'll keep being remade. If you like kind of like the 90s mindless action genre, which I know a lot of us do, Surviving the game's pretty fun, uh, but it's just not the most nuanced. This comes from a 4K scan of the inner positive. It looks very nice, natural, film grain, all that stuff. Not a lot in the way of like nicks or scratches. It's been cleaned up impeccably. This was sourced from like Warner Brothers slash New Line. So they did kind of their, I'm pretty sure they did their own uh, scanning at the their at MPI and just they do a really good job every time. This comes from with a new commentary track with Ernest Dickerson, the director, which is pretty cool. You get to learn how he almost directed Blade, which was an interesting tidbit. He almost directed Seven. He caused, but he like he convinced like the studio that that was like a work, like how they could approach that story. And they're like, oh, that's cool. We're going to get someone else that's high, like a grade to do this now that we know how to do it. And he's just like, oh shit, okay, cool. I talked myself out of a job. So there's a lot of cool, interesting facts uh, within the commentary track, which are pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, overall, Surviving the Game, it's not the best movie, but if you like something mindless, it's pretty decent. Nice. Uh, I remember seeing that, and I'm trying to think if I'm like mixing that up with South- Southern Comfort, which was um, another <laughs> sort of like, I guess it would be like the hillbilly, backwoodsy kind of survival <laughs> um so yeah i might have to check that out um so i saved my the best for last um this was one that everybody was really excited for Uh, that is the 4k um at least um american uh 4k um premiere of fear and desire um stanley kubrick's first film um there is a, a 62 minute cut and a 70 minute cut um, both are presented here and here. So, uh, yeah. Now, um, Kubrick would, of course, do um, some truly great, um, not only truly great films, of course, but truly great war films. Pass of Glory is so insanely good. Um, having said that, um, like also Full Metal Jacket, of course, but having said that, I think Fear and Desire is interesting in how Kubrick is really like early on in his first feature, um, flexing his um, visual style. Um, his This has a very dreamy, kind of surreal, at times, take on a war film. It is, um, Kubrick was always very anti-war, and you, you definitely get that sense here. He never... Uh, glorifies it or glamorizes it in fact it's the opposite he kind of shows you how ugly and disgusting and shameful war is and you certainly get like that feeling from this 
it's definitely not like in hindsight i can see if you've never seen a kubrick film like people back in the day like this was definitely a game changer but like it wasn't like has a glory or full metal jacket or like you know for just talking about his war movies or of course like i don't know the shining and all these other like really genre bending defying films um the storytelling's fine i think that it it's you don't really have his storytelling and narrative prowess really that refined so some plot elements feel a little bit shaggy or maybe a little bit lacking but yeah you can still see like there is enormous talent here um it's kind of exciting because we do get both uh cuts of the film and um i i don't know if a lot of people remember this but like i remember when you couldn't even really access this movie very easily it was a lost film or semi-lost film for a long time so we've come a long way from that to having a beautiful 4k restoration of it it looks gorgeous Mm -hmm. you get we talked about grain and of course you do get that nice like great grain look this is from a 35 millimeter camera negative it does get a little overly grainy at times but i feel like i would rather have that than like it artificially wiped but yeah the contrast between the black and white is great um it's a very moody and evocative uh, film. Uh, and you can kind of get a sense a little bit in the back there. But yeah, all that looks really fantastic. We get uh, two commentary tracks, one for each cut of the film, which is really great. And then what I think is really cool is we get a trio of short films from Stanley Kubrick that um, I don't know if I've ever seen that as a um, supplemental material um, before as far as like fans of Kubrick getting these released on a disc so that all by itself I think is awesome and yeah I don't know Warner Brothers needs to step up their game and get another Kubrick 4k release this year I was really disappointed we didn't get one last year I was thinking we would get yeah. eyes wide shut or they don't have a lot left um what else yeah. was there Lo- um, Lolita, Lolita and uh Barry Lyndon. Oh yeah, okay. So like yeah. chop chop, let's get going. But hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, we get uh something this year. But yeah, uh meantime, it's amazing, such a great release. Um this was like co-funded by the Library of Congress, so that's really awesome. Again, they really did do a really great job of making this uh, um film really shine. Is it my favorite Kubrick? No. Is it like the Rosetta Stone for Coop like Kubrick and like has a lot of like the themes imagery that he would be famous for. Absolutely. So yeah, it's really fun. And, you know, Kino also previously released killer's kiss. Yes. Um, so you want to check those out as well, but I mean, I, anytime I can add another Kubrick 4k to my collection is a great day. So check this out. Uh, if you're a film buff, it's you, you need to own it. Absolutely. Uh, I love rounding out my Cooper collection. I wish I could like finish on a title that was as prestigious as that one, but mine is not. It is just schlocky 4K stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is the last one from Shout Studios, my final title. This is from director Eli Roth. And this is the remake of Death Wish with Bruce Willis. Uh, this came out in 2018. I missed it. Um, I... I had at the time had not seen the original Death Wish. Since that time, uh, our dear friends at Kino, which you were just talking about, released the original Bronson and like the fourth and fifth movie. The original Bronson on 4K, the fifth, fourth and fifth movie on Blu ray. Um, but having watched some Death Wish now, going to this one, uh, I know this has a very, very poor reputation. People seem to hate it. Um, I don't think it's good, but like surviving the game, there's enough in here that entertains me that I can kind of appreciate it for what it is. Um, it is not up to the level of like of the Bronson one. There's a lot that the Bronson does that is more visceral, especially in terms of the initial attack on the family, um, and just how his believability as the man who is like going on this path and like kind of stumbling through it at points, but just like 
eventually like becoming this vigilante and how that kind of how he interacts with like the police and getting vigilante justice now eli ross version um the first thing you got to realize is that bruce willis plays a doctor in this which is instantly not believable to me <laughs> i was like what are we doing here we have lost the plot here <laughs> uh but i i kind of set that aside um because i do like bruce willis i just don't find him believable as a doctor um once like it's his family gets attacked and th the things that i won't spoil outright but people know what death wishes i i believe um once um his family gets attacked and he is kind of switched into the mode of like maybe he needs to start getting vigilante justice because the cops can't solve this crime and all this stuff it it goes pretty quickly into the pulpy territory of just like he picks up things pretty quickly he does kind of stumble his way through things occasionally but he is kind of like a superhero in this movie which i think is kind of what Bronson turned into more so later in the original films, but it just, he's going around and he is killing people in the most bloody, gruesome ways, which is when I had the most fun with this movie because it is Eli Roth and just like seeing him like crush people's like heads with like, like, uh, like a car lift or like seeing like different things like go like impale people's heads and just, it's the most gnarly gory stuff that you want from eli roth and i will admit i had a blast whenever like the violence was being dispensed because it's so cartoonish it's so like outlandish you got to have fun with it it's like whenever i was watching uh ross recent thanksgiving he just delights in gore and he's just like really good at it in terms of the emotional effectiveness it doesn't work because like it's bruce willis he's not quite phoning it in like he kind of got like in recent years especially with his diagnosis of like his defining mental faculties but like back then he like he still had a, he was still even before that phoning it in quite a bit of the time it's not complete phoning in territory but he just doesn't have that spark in this one where like you believe him in this role as like someone who's vulnerable and like hurting but getting revenge it's just like and then like whenever He's trying to like have this connection with his doctor or his daughter or and um like his dynamic with once again Vincent D'Onofrio shows up in this one. So I got two D'Onofrio sightings this week, which I was cool with. Um it just it all kind of seems very surface level, which for this type of type of film, maybe that's fine for most people. It was mostly fine for me, but it, it just I can understand why people say like this movie is dog shit i've heard people say that this movie is dog shit i understand that but if you just want kind of like vigilante justice like gory goopy goodness it does the trick it's not great but it just it does it, like eli roth he's a good director even when he's bad <laughs> and so um I, that's kind of my take on it it's just like kind of a guilty pleasure but i don't have guilty pleasures it's just like a good bad movie for me um and this 4K release, it's from a 4K master, shot digitally. It looks very nice. It's just crisp, very like nicely detailed, um, just like, rich colors, all that good stuff. It's just a really nice Dolby Vision transfer. Um, it does come with an audio commentary track from Roth and I believe his producer. Um, this has a couple of like uh, a section for deleted scenes and extended scenes. And there's uh, commentary tracks on the deleted scenes as well. Um, and then there is a like a 11 minute making up featurette. So if you like the film, this is the best presentation to date uh, from Screen Factory. But it, it's it's very much an acquired taste and most probably won't like like it. But it just it kind of I was in a good mood this week, I guess, between this and Rings. These like dog shit movies just kind of like entertain me. So take with take with that as you will. Yeah, I mean, I I get it. There's definitely like it. What you were you were, so I haven't seen that one. Um, I know I, I of course heard of it. I've it's just one that I've sort of skipped. But um, have you seen um Death Sentence? That's sort of like a death. I was thinking of that movie so much during this because I <laughs> I'm so mad it's not on Blu-ray. I saw that in theaters back in the days, like 2007. Mm. I had a blast with that one, and I really really would love to see that in HD. And I think. 
from what I remember, it's been a while. I think that is a much superior movie because Kevin Bacon is on in that movie. He is like so in the pocket. I, I really like that movie. Yeah. Okay. So that answered my question. I was going to say, I had seen Death Sentence. I liked that quite a bit. I, I think like that might make an interesting double feature. But yeah, you said like clearly um, Death Sentence is like the superior version of that because it, it feels so much like like Death Sentence feels like a Death Wish film, but they couldn't maybe get call it that, I guess. But yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what, what I love about we have such a wide range of stuff we talk about. You know, it's like mm -hmm. classics. It's like um schlock it's like everything in between i think like a good balanced diet of movies you should have a little bit of everything right so mm -hmm. <laughs> with that i hope you all enjoyed this video and we have a blast talking about these movies see even your dog agrees that uh mm -hmm. this is a pretty lit show and um just uh as always please like subscribe all that good stuff uh we really appreciate it and thanks for hanging out with us